Some viewers may find this disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this year's Halloween special. Last year, I showed off the Gregory Horror Show, an anime miniseries specifically designed to be scary. However, what I've learned over time is that the scariest things come from places where you're not expecting them. A bright and happy kids show? What could possibly go wrong? I mean, it's not like they portray things like torture, stalkers, and the depths of one's own delusions. Today I'm going to take you through the top 25 most disturbing episodes from kids cartoons. I'm not saying that these episodes are good, nor am I saying that they're bad, because at several points on this list, I really don't know which category I'd put them in. Some rules. I cannot put an episode that I'd already reviewed on this list. Rule 2. There's a difference between disturbing and disgusting. We're avoiding gore fests here, for the most part. I'm also going to try to avoid the house fancy type of episodes. Those that are mostly okay with one thing that comes batshit out of nowhere, just to scare you. Rule 3. I'm going to avoid Halloween episodes because those targets are a bit too easy. But if the episode doesn't take place specifically on a Halloween type festival, it counts. If it was a spooky themed episode that aired near Halloween, but doesn't take place during Halloween, it still counts. I, I know that that's an odd rule, but sometimes the line on that is kind of weird, and it makes it a lot easier on my end. But enough rules. Let's begin. Come, let's tiptoe into the dark. One good scare out of you. Ah, uh, the Fairly Odd Parents. Remember when they were good? I mean, what is this dog shit? Beyond how terrible the plot is, is the fact that they seem to have forgotten this little episode. You know, the one that said Timmy was a great pet owner and the only reason his pets died was because his parents couldn't feed them when he went away to summer camp. Of course, Timmy's pet, Eddie, just might have watched the Fairly Odd Dog, or else he wouldn't have wanted so badly to kill Timmy. Yeah, our first episode on this list is about a dead pet coming back to life in order to get revenge on the person who he thought killed him, even though the owner is completely innocent. Yeah! Beyond that, they made this undead gerbil look as creepy as possible with bits and chunks of flesh missing. And on top of that, we see the cartoonish and over-the-top ways that the gerbil tries killing Timmy and his entire family. Yes, a <clears throat> cute little gerbil tries to kill someone and his entire family. Why it ended up so low on this list is because at no point did they take the story seriously. Seriously, it comes across as totally comedic, for the most part. Everything I touch dies! <laughs> oh, Dinkleberg! Aren't you gonna come over and give my wife a congratulatory hand touch? You'll find a bite much worse than our bar. One good scare ought to do you some good. I just love the day the Ed stood still. It's really a gem of an episode. When Ed sees a monster in one of Eddie's scams, he wants to become one, and Double D decides to indulge his fantasy. He dresses Ed up as a monster, and then he truly believes that he's become the monster. What's with you? I am a monster! <laughs> Why this episode works so good on a horror level is because for the longest time, you don't see what the monster looks like. You just see that more and more people are horrified by it. What is this sound that makes Rogue soil his trousers? And slowly the monster gets them one by one. It goes to great lengths to use the monster movie tropes, and it also uses clever animation tropes. He wants to skin off my bones, Double D! <laughs> If you should find a daily grinder, tie the taps in on the mind to help a mind is so inclined, I have a small suggestion. You know, upgrading technology never seems to work out as planned. Mom, what's happening? Hmm, very interesting. Help! I mean, one day you got a functional Windows 7 that does everything you tell it to do, but then you upgrade to Windows 8, a program so obsessed with trying to be hip and edgy that it comes across as half functional. It thinks that removing things that have been there from the beginning, like the start bar, is a good idea because they're old and outdated. And when you upgrade an exoskin, it starts to take control of your life. Make you someone who you're not, and tries to eat you things that you don't want to do. Hmm, your second skin. Don't we look beautiful? But wouldn't we rather be beautiful in a normal way? Beauty is a 24-hour job. Normal is good. Normal is good. Eventually, it starts talking to you in a really creepy voice, giving some sort of mind control. The ways that this thing controls Jenny is just creepy. Not to mention this episode has an ending that would make you really curious as to how a third Raggedy Android episode would go across. God only knows what problems they're gonna make for Windows 9. Most impolite. Kicking buttocks is not the sort of thing a normal girl does. But if you dare into my land, you should prepare for questions. But will you share in this nightmare would be my only question. 
you know, there are a lot of things that you'd never think you'd see in a kid's show, like suicide, excessive animal abuse, or cannibalism. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Well, how cannibalism is portrayed in this episode, cannibalism, is kind of vague. When Fergie, this thing there, wants to bring a chocolate bunny comb to a party, he decides that he wants it all to himself. So he disguises it as his cousin, Candace. Then during a dance scene, he ends up... Can't look suspicious! Must tango! Mmm, chocolate! <laughs> doing that, romance must run very well in his family. <laughs> then he eats her. Okay, so there really isn't any cannibalism, I think, since people put chocolate inside pinatas. Look! Candy's hair! And her glasses! <laughs> oh. <sighs> Good gobstopper! Faggy ate Candace! But the authorities dress Fergie up as Hannibal Lecter and put him on trial for cannibalism. Just the fact that someone put the concept of cannibalism in a kid's show and went so far as to put him on trial for it, that's kind of disturbing. Not to mention that he actually thinks that being selfish is worse than being convicted of cannibalism. I don't see why not since cannibals are apparently shots to the moon that's loaded with candy. Seriously, what the fuck? Wait, serious finale? What? That's why I can't tell the truth! If you don't, your shame will consume you! Consume you! Consume you! If your hair lies like a sandmill, one good stare of a deal. Believe it or not, there are actually many shows that went through seasonal rot besides The Simpsons, Family Guy, and Spongebob. One that comes to mind is Dexter's Lab. After it was arbitrarily extended past its prime, it was given a new art style that fell right into the uncanny valley. On top of that, the types of episodes got interesting. In the episode Jeepers Creepers, Where is Peepers, an anime-style villain kidnaps a dog creature, and for most of the episode turns him inside out in a horrifying, grotesque way. At first, it's not so bad, but his agony just goes on and on. It's a horribly unpleasant thing to watch. The worst part of the episode is that it has him there suffering in agony and doesn't even seem to concern itself about him because he's just there in the background while the episode is happening. And yes, his screams of pain are quite audible. And then he turns into a giant fleshy dragon. Yeah, that happens. Along with the angry son from Super Mario Bros. 3, the Sapphire Dragon was one of the biggest monsters of my childhood. What can I really say about this thing? It has flame breath that turns people into lifeless sapphire statues, and the concept of being petrified is always horrifying. On top of that, this thing has aspirations. The Sapphire Dragon! The most dangerous Shengang Wu! It is only to be used as an absolute last resort. It will turn your enemy into a sapphire statue. And the guy next door, the old lady down the street, the kids at the playground. It turns everyone, good, evil, or indifferent, to sapphire. And after it's taken over enough people, it turns them into its minions. With the more victims it claims, the more powerful it gets. This thing left such an imprint on me that I always wanted to know whose hands it was in during the show. But alas, it was like the Golden Tiger Claws, a game-breaking Shen Gong Wu that the writers knew that they had to keep out of the story to keep any sort of tension, which kinda made me worry about when it would pop up again. Every time the Shen Gong Wu changed hands, like in the very next episode, I wanted to know where the hell this thing was. And then it finally popped up, and it was disappointing, to say the least. What? What is that? <laughs> uh, guys? That is quite bad. I would delight in taking flight into the night. If I may give you such a fright, you know I surely would. I'm just gonna let this one speak for itself.
If you should find a daily grinder, tie the taps in on the mind to help unwind it. So inclined, I have a small suggestion. Hey, remember what I said? As long as the episode doesn't specifically take place on a Halloween-type holiday, it's allowed. Plus, if there were none of my rules, I'd go with Jack in the Haunted House. I believe that episode is much more disturbing than this one, but this one is fairly disturbing too, for the same reason that that's life is kind of disturbing. Jack walks into a haunted graveyard and must fight off zombies. That's pretty much the gist of it. Yeah, why I don't talk about the show too often, except in, like, lists or something, is because it's very hard to talk about an individual episode. In this episode, Samurai Jack fights zombies all night, and since they're pretty much infinite, they begin to slowly whittle him down. Not to mention, there's the final showdown where he's fighting his own sword, and the feeling of helplessness is really instilled in this episode. I will eat your You'll find I bite much worse than I bark One good scare or a do you sound good Hey, would you look at that? More zombies! This time, instead of fighting them in the graveyard, we get to see a full outbreak take place. What? What do you mean? An outbreak. An outbreak of joy. It starts out, innocently enough, Gumball and Darwin are a bit grumpy, so their father gives them a special hug to cheer them up. That... that came out wrong. But back on track, their teacher thinks that this happiness is some kind of disease. Stop smiling. Okay. This should prove my point. Oh, I know. <sighs> See? This is proof that these children are diseased. Everyone thinks that Miss Simeon is crazy until it actually turns out to be a disease. that kills Gumball and Darwin, and turns them into joy-infused zombies with rainbow drool. I, I always knew that joy was contagious, but Jesus. The only way to stop this zombie outbreak is by playing a piece of music. The majority of the episode is Miss Simeon racing to get to the PA system past these zombies, and the tone is really good here. I should really talk about this show sometime in the future. If you dare into my lair, you should prepare for quite a scare. But will you share in this nightmare would be my only question. It feels odd that I'm suggesting one of my least favorite episodes from a show for this list. But Dan vs. the Telemarketer fits the criteria. What do I mean by this? This episode is a sequel to the episode Dan vs. the Imposter, or Dan vs. Dan, where someone who looked exactly like Dan tried to take over his life, and Dan solved this problem by sending him to jail. Now he's back and he wants nothing more than revenge. His plan is fucking terrifying. First, the imposter gets a job as a telemarketer, and then pretty much uses his position to stalk and harass Dan, preventing him from getting any peace or even sleeping. If it ended there, that would be one thing, but the imposter's plan is so much more complex. He knows that every step that Dan is going to make, to the point where he can make a supervillain blush, and that's because he disguised himself as Dan's cat, Mr. Mumbles. You just never know what I'll do. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Maybe I'll dress up as your cat. Do you love it? Or I could dress up as you and steal a police car. <laughs> Who knows? And implanted a tracking device in Dan's teeth. That tracking device also transmits voices. Sir, we will give this matter all the attention it deserves. Which means none, of course. <laughs> he can't. Hear those voices in your head, silly? Come on. You leave me alone! So yeah, if you think the telemarketers are annoying, imagine one being in your head, never shutting up for 24-7. And when you try to tell someone of this, they think you've gone completely insane. You know, until this conspiracy against you does drive you completely insane. Stop playing games and tell me what you want! To drive you absolutely batty, nutso, around the bend. And I have to say, I don't expect it to take long now. Let's tiptoe into the dark. One good scare out of you. 
When a show changes its age rating, it truly is a magical thing. The shows with this newfound freedom tend to stretch their tendrils out and do whatever they can now get away with, and the punchline is less than zero. If any episode can prove that Friendship is Magic isn't your typical Friends Forever kids show, then none of them will do it. The entire tone of this episode is intense, as one of the characters delves slower and slower into their own insanity, to the point where she telefrags the beach ball and... Hi, girls! Oh, hi, Twilight. How's it going? Great. Just great. I'd hate to cause a rift between such good friends. Are you, are you sure this is a kid show? If it's not the smartest, most honorable of the main characters cornering three kids with threats that she is going to help them and solve their problems, it's the most timid of the main cast snapping the neck of a bear. I've always had mixed feelings towards the Kids Next Door episode, Operation Archive. It goes on to tell how kids created adults and the wars that sparked in between them, with number one narrating it. I like the story that it tells, and I definitely love the homage. It would actually be kind of interesting if they went with this as a full series idea. But it's actually an episode like that 90s show from The Simpsons. You gotta take it separately from any continuity of the show to enjoy it in its own right, because there's no logical way that it could have happened. It also ends like this. What could they? The adults created places to imprison children called schools. And if that wasn't bad enough, they invented homework and after-school activities. And do you hear that? <laughs> Coming from the fluorescent lights above your heads? That's the adult microwave cranial jellifier, slowly turning our brains into milkshakes. It's Rainbow Monkey! They're making us eat Rainbow Monkey! And then they make you brush your teeth because of your teeth water. And they can't implant the sun on the tracking devices they use to tell where you go when you escape. Everything you know is a lie! If you should find a daily grinder tab attaching on the mind to help unwind is so inclined, I have a small suggestion. Tell you the truth, I could have gone with any episode where Ren gets mad. Even ignoring his cute little upbringing, he is not the most seen of characters. In this episode, Ren and Stimpy get a bunch of fan mail. Correction! Stimpy gets a ton of fan mail, and Ren gets none whatsoever. This leaves Ren practically distraught. Everybody loves you! People always love the stupid one, but nobody ever loves the jerk. Paradox! 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 In order to cheer Ren up, Stimpy makes him the president of his fan club. This doesn't turn out to be the best idea. All the fans have only good things to say about Stimpy, and only bad things to say about Ren, which slowly makes him madder and madder at Stimpy, to the point where he's debating killing Stimpy. I chose this episode over Sven Hoek because, for one, the creepy factor goes on for quite a bit longer. This episode is 22 minutes long. And two, Ren is mad at Stimpy for something that isn't Stimpy's fault. Think about it. Your best friend wants to kill you because everyone likes you more than him. Also, there's quite the interesting visuals as the animation gets more and more deranged, with Ren's descent into madness. If you dare into my lair, you should prepare for quite a scare. But will you share in this nightmare would be my only question. Mental tricks are quite a frightening thing. In this episode, Robin is afflicted with the dust that allows him to see, hear, and feel Slade, his greatest adversary. To top it off, none of Robin's friends can see Slade, making them think that Robin's obsession is leading him further and further into madness. The imaginary fiend idea is a really interesting one, and though it's been explored many times before and in many ways, I don't think that it's been explored quite this well. We see the Phantom lead Robin further and further into what seems like madness, him getting beaten up by a creature that can't be touched or stopped, and his friends wondering what the hell is going on. I won't stop. Not now, not ever. I am the thing that keeps you up at night. The evil that haunts every dark corner of your mind. If your hair lies like a sandal, one good stare of 
This thing is fucking creepy. End of story. It looks like a fusion of Robbie the Rabbit from Silent Hill and the original Ronald McDonald. Everything about Frybo is unsettling. From the way it moves, the way it force feeds people fries. And apparently you can get away with copious amounts of blood in a kid's cartoon if it's ketchup. Actually, yeah, that's always been the case. But, but seriously, burn that thing in fire. It, it's fucking terrifying. Wait, you've always hated Frybo? Yes! Come with me now, don't be a wimp. One little scare ought to do you some good. You know, another thing that I never thought I'd seen in a kid's cartoon? Actual, literal torture. Solitary confinement, to be exact. This episode starts off with Finster fretting that none of her punishments work on TJ. He just laughs them all off. So she comes up with a new one. This is the box. Get caught running on the blacktop, go to the box. Take cuts in line, go to the box. Any horseplay, joking around, or unauthorized fun of any kind, the box. No questions asked. Go it's laughed at at first, but when TJ gets in the box, Finster keeps all the other kids far away. And when TJ has to deal with his own thoughts, he goes further and further into insanity. Time to let him out, Miss Finster. What do you say we give him an extra two minutes? <gasps> By the end of it, he's completely snapped, and will do whatever Finster says in order to be a good boy. Had enough, Detweiler? Yeah, so yes, TJ's had enough. Fine, then you might come out. Keep in mind, this is TJ we're talking about, the kid who wasn't phased by dealing with HAL 9000. The creepy part is how thoroughly this punishment got to him. No! Ah, the box! The box! But he's gotta eat something! He's traumatized by the sight of squares, and when he's forced to deal with the prospect of going back to the box... Not me, will you? Back to the box! No, not the box! Not the box! Tom and Jerry could get pretty cruel. I don't think anyone would argue that. But for the most part, it's kept funny. And that's a large part because both Tom and Jerry are on an equal fighting plane. Alternatively, you can have a piano kill Tom and put the power of whether or not he gets into heaven into Jerry's hands, his sworn enemy, and the person he spent his entire life hunting down. If Jerry doesn't forgive Tom for everything in the episode Heavenly Puss, then Tom goes straight to hell with a demon dog and fire and stuff. But if you don't want to take my word for it that this is one of the most messed up cartoon episodes ever made, Mac Ronin, creator of The Simpsons, said that this was one of the darkest things that he'd ever seen. The only thing that stops it from being any higher on this list is that in the end, it's all a dream. Still, be careful of what kind of enemies you make. You never know what kind of torment you'll be under when it's all over. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the scene where they go through the various ways that certain cats had died, including three kittens drowned in a bag. If you should find a daily grind, a tab it taps in on the mind to help unwind is so inclined, I have a small suggestion. Return to slab, or suffer my curse. Sorry, dude, you lose again. I'm not going with you. Oh, come on. One of the most difficult parts of this list was separating nostalgia from shows and episodes I've seen multiple times. King Ramses might have been freaky as all hell when I was a kid. The, let's call it charm, hasn't aged the best though. And things like Freaky Fred aren't that scary to me because I've seen them a million times. However, there is one episode of Courage the Godly Dog that I still find frightening no matter how many times I've seen. The House of Discontent. It starts out typical enough with creepy voices telling Muriel and Eustace to get out and then having them get attacked by things like groceries and water. When Courage breaks into the house, they fall into the basement and come across this thing. This thing still creeps me out. It's not just the way it looks, but the way it talks. I'm the spirit of the harvest food. And I'm a bucket of sardines. Not to mention that it's fucking pissed off. There's also creepy organ music in the background. The plot involves them either growing something or suffering the consequences. And when the consequences finally do come around, the only music that plays is the chiming of a clock. It really is a masterpiece of atmosphere. And seriously, what the fuck, what the fuck even is that thing? I, I mean, I know that it's an ominous flowing head, but how? How do you come to creating that thing? By midnight. You either grow or go. But if you dare into my land, you should prepare for question. But will you share in this nightmare would be my only question.
Huh, Gravity Falls was holding back in Season 1. Who knew? I'll be honest, maybe this one is just me, but the whole clingy love shtick has always been terrifying, even when they try to play comedically. In fact, I don't know why this was ever used comedically. Now here's a really funny thing. This episode was aired when Five Nights at Freddy's started making the rounds. Hello, friends. Hoo-ha the owl is dead. And it was completely coincidental. Just about everything in this episode is terrifying, though. From even the concepts. I can download your brain into the game with me, and we'll be together forever. A lot of it is in the imagery. I mean, beyond the melty face stuff of the animatronics. Everything about Jiffany is unsettling. Mostly from the way she talks, and how quickly she flips emotions. She talks about deleting someone and trying to take control of someone's life as if it's the most darling thing in the world. She doesn't require any power to function, and there's no way to escape from her, except by destroying her disc, which may or may not have worked. It's amazing how she can go from cute to terrifying in a split second. And to tell you from experience, there are people like this in the world, and you'll never really know what they're like until it's far too late. I seem to remember someone promising to be my boyfriend. Have you guys ever noticed that the Powerpuff Girls was kinda screwed up sometimes? I mean, they challenge courage for how much horror that they can put into a typical episode. And sometimes, they even go beyond. The thought of your loved ones turning against you is terrifying, as are many of the scenarios that this show took us through. The most screwed up episode, though, has to be Knock It Off. In this episode, the professor's old roommate, Dick Hardly, tries to take the professor's success by making his own Powerpuff Girls and selling them around the world to make a quick buck. Many of these Powerpuff Girls are faulty, even to the point of certain limbs falling off. They look goofy at first, but as the episode goes on, they look more and more deformed. This actually kind of reminds me of a couple of earlier episodes, Twisted Sister to name one, where, feeling that they've got too much work, the girls create a fourth Powerpuff Girl, who, while deformed, is still just as sentient as the girls. Along those lines, there's also the Rowdy Rough Boys. Throughout this episode, it's hard to see the faulty Powerpuff Girls as any less sentient than the originals. Hell, at one point, Dick Hardly makes a perfect buttercup and has her melted down because she was perfect. And towards the end, we see how harmful that process really was. Not to mention the infamous little part where all the faulty Powerpuff Girls turn on Dick. You never gave us love. Where was our love? If you should find a daily grind, a tag of taps and on the mind to help a mind is so inclined, I have a small suggestion. Ah, Spongebob. Even without suspending my rule for not including an episode that I already reviewed, there would be at least a dozen episodes I could have gone with. I could have picked Spongehenge with its haunting melodies. I could have picked To Love a Patty with its strange infatuation, and how it seems to be similar to Squid Baby and having one of the writers let out their fetish. Then there's Gone, which was clearly inspired by a Twilight Zone episode, and that's not even counting episodes that are creepy in a good way, like Ghoul Fools or Shanghai. But I said it once before and I'll say it again. The creepiest episode of this show to me is Boating Buddies. Why is that? Well, it seems to take SpongeBob's obsession with Squidward up to stalker levels, and not to mention there's clearly an odd amount of attraction from his side. He clearly wants to be with Squidward for what I can only assume are his diabolical purposes. Even more so in Squid's visit where SpongeBob seemed kind of leapt out of the creepiness. On top of that, this episode gives off a severe claustrophobic vibe. All that comes from the fact that Squidward doesn't have any breathing room. But, in all seriousness, this episode is about being trapped with your stalker and the world thinking that it's just the dandiest thing ever. Many people find this episode merely annoying, and I would too, but there's just some sort of uncanniness to the point where it seems like SpongeBob is trying to assimilate Squidward. <laughs> If you dare into my land, you should prepare for quite a scam. But will you share in this nightmare would be my only question. Perhaps the closest episode to breaking my Halloween episode rule, we've got the Puppet Master from Avatar The Last Airbender. You've probably noticed that the theme of losing control has been quite prominent throughout my list. Losing control of the situation, your life, or even your body. It's something that's always seemed to terrify me personally. Perhaps that's some inbred fear built up over years of psychological trauma, but that's another story. This episode follows that concept to a T. Since the Nostalgia Critic already covered this episode fairly well in his top 11 best Avatar episodes, there really isn't much else I have to say. I, but as episodes go, this is probably the best episode on the list as an episode in itself. The rats that scream. 
scurried across the floor of my cage were nothing more than skins filled with liquid. If your hair lies like a sandmill, one good stare of all the I like Rockless Modern Life. It, it was a really good show, and has aged fairly well, despite its odd concepts. But there are some things you shouldn't put in a kid's show. Having your main character getting seduced by someone is one of those things. When Mrs. Big Head feels like she isn't getting enough attention from her husband, she tries to seduce Rocco, who is completely innocent of the whole situation, even when she makes him watch a nature documentary about the mating habits of frogs. This episode actually starts out innocently enough until about halfway through the episode. Would you sit me up, darling? Then Rocco ends up ripping off the dress. You like my eyes? Huh? Oh, yes. They're lovely. And then when Mr. Big Head comes in, she kisses Rocco. Like Boating Buddies, it gives off a very claustrophobic and awkward vibe. Mr. Bighead uses this as a wake-up call to do some freaky shit. End the episode! The plot is over! E end the episode! End it now! If your hair lies like a sandmill, one good stare of all of This episode starts with a lovebird getting kicked out by his wife. I'm a lovebird. That was my wife, sweetie puss. Lovebirds can't live without love, so I guess I'll just have to end it all. Okay, wait, what? Yeah, this episode kind of starts with our main character thinking of a bunch of suicide attempts and spends the rest of the episode trying to get himself killed by Sylvester in what's apparently his first appearance. Why won't Sylvester eat the bird? Because he thinks that the bird is poisoned. Even for Looney Tunes, it's oddly demented to spend an entire episode with a character trying to get themselves killed and trying to get someone else to assist in their suicide. Maybe time has just been unfriendly to it and this was once upon a time the funniest thing ever. No, no, I'd rather die first. One little scare off do you sound good. <laughs> Alright, you guys knew from the very beginning what my number one would be. And don't say that you didn't. My number one is Dark Harvest from Invader Zim. Hey, once in a while, I gotta go with the obvious choice. There's a reason that this episode has the reputation as the most disturbing cartoon episode of all time. Or at least the most disturbing episode of Invader Zim, one of the most disturbing cartoons ever made. Leave school grounds, it will explode. The basic plot is that Zim is going around stealing people's organs and replacing them with stuff. It's a classic alien plot, but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. Star, you're a hideous blob of stolen organs! I've been working out. <laughs> Not to mention all the grotesque organs that we see spewing out. There are a bunch of kids getting attacked, and many moments of terrifying tension. From imagery to concept, Dark Harvest is the most disturbing episode from a kid's cartoon. Also, it may have inspired Murderer or something. Hey, you're full of organs, aren't you? Why, yes. Yes, I am. And you wouldn't notice if you were, say, missing a few. You hear the screeching of an owl. 